One thing I'd recommend is um, even if your, your entity doesn't own Bitcoin yet or hasn't worked with Bitcoin, at a personal level, it's worth experimenting with. It's worth researching and understanding how it works and actually trying it because that's what, that's what addresses that intangible aspect. If you, you know, interact with a mobile wallet or interact with a hardware wallet, if you send it to someone else, if you receive it, if you um, use it in, in an application, you earn it from playing a game or you, you, you tip someone over Noster uh, with it, um, it can kind of open your eyes to the power of the technology. It's, you know, a lot of analysts, when they look at it, they just see it as a price line on a screen. Um, and it seems very intangible. And, you know, they might not be able to differentiate uh, at a technical level what, what makes Bitcoin different than Dogecoin, for example. According to macro guru Lynn Alden, the failure of numerous regional banks this year has helped the general public see Bitcoin for what it is. Alden emphasized at a recent MicroStrategy Globe panel session that unlike the rest of the globe, Americans are now starting to grasp that banks are unsafe. Banks are unsafe and there is risk there, especially if you are beyond certain insurance levels, but I think people took it for granted. Most people don't bother learning about the banks they do business with, despite the fact that their deposits are being used to invest in a wide range of assets with which you are unfamiliar. Even if we wanted to, we can't since many of them are private. Alden claims that many investors' eyes are being opened by the present financial crisis to the worth of Bitcoin. The macro guru highlights some of the Crypto King's core features that make it an alluring asset class. So, we're getting up close and personal with some of the global issues, and I believe ideas like the narrative of Bitcoin and self-custody of assets, having assets that can't be diluted, and having assets that are not someone else's obligation are becoming more prominent. Some of the things she mentioned throughout the interview are great additions to the story. Over the past several decades, there's been a lot of fintech activity, obviously, a lot of companies spinning up around fintech. And, you know, mostly what they do is they provide overlays on top of the existing financial system. So they're not really changing things from the root layer, but they're making the, the way that we interface with the financial system a little bit more convenient, faster, uh, making use of software, making use of new technology. And I think what the importance of Bitcoin is, is, is basically a computer science breakthrough that changes how we interact with money at the root layer. Uh, basically, it's open source money, it's global money, it's, it's decentralized money in, in, in basically a cloud. You can access it around the world, you can send it around the world, and that's a very powerful concept that is very different than, you know, decades of, of, of basically fintech innovations. And if we, if we back up further, um, the way I would put it is that, you know, for centuries, most of banking has had two major functions. One is the, the provision of credit, and the other one is basically about making money faster, right? So, you know, for a long time you had gold as kind of the base money, and then for, for centuries you had various kind of proto-banking technologies to, to make the movement of that value um, separate from having to actually move and verify gold every time. And so the, what they shared in common was that it always relied on trust. There, there was, you know, the Hawala system was, was active for, you know, a thousand years or so. Um, there's bills of exchange that are written on papyrus. Um, there's, there's bills of exchange written on paper across the Silk Road. Um, uh, you know, Islamic merchants are, are thought to have brought banking to, to Europe eventually, to, to Venice and, and, you know, places throughout Italy. And so you had the uh, proliferation of, of more complex banking services there. And it's really about, you know, allowing the ownership of gold and, and ownership of underlying money to move faster than, than gold itself can move. But really, it was the second half of the 1800s that really opened up the speed of transactions because you had the invention of telecommunication systems and you had the, the, the laying of the undersea cables across the continents. And so from that point, the separation of transaction speed, which was now the speed of light, was completely removed from the, the speed of, of physical money, physical settlement. And so for, for about a century and a half, we've been in this environment where you know, transactions move at the speed of light. It's very simple to do a transaction. It could be done as simple as Morse code. Now we do it differently, whereas actual underlying settlement, um, you know, got basically dropped away. And what Bitcoin, I think, represents is kind of the, the ability to do uh, settlement, final settlement, um, at that same speed of telecommunications, which, which prior to 2008, 2009, uh, wasn't really possible. Uh, and even the underlying technologies that made that happen didn't come into fruition uh, until the, the years leading up to that. And so I'll stop there, but essentially Bitcoin is just kind of this revolutionary new way to think of money, to send money, to operate with money from the root layer rather than just like an overlay. 
one of the things that the banking system does is it potentially changes forward expectations of how much the Fed will be able to tighten, uh, at least within a certain time period. And so, you know, if you step back a second and you think, okay, you know, with, with this much debt in the system, with these large deficits, are they able to get to a, a, a period of positive real rates and then hold that for a long period of time? Um, and if you have that expectation, then assets like gold or, or Bitcoin are perhaps less useful to you. I mean, the speed and programmability of Bitcoin is still interesting, but maybe from a, you know, um, you know, a safety perspective, you say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with the banking system, I'm fine with treasuries, I think they're going to maintain purchasing power. On the other hand, if you, if you, you know, kind of look in history, generally when you get um, sovereign debt, and it's not just the United States, it's across Europe, it's across Japan, when you, when you reach these high levels of sovereign debt, like well over 100%, usually those bonds and that cash um, does not make a very good forward um, savings instrument on a, on a real basis. Um, now that can have a, a big spectrum for how that turns out. Obviously on the extreme end, you can get sharp, very, very sharp uh, currency devaluation, hyperinflation in some cases. In other cases, you just have this, this prolonged period of financial oppression, uh, generally rates below the inflation rate. Sometimes they go above the rate, but sometimes they come back down and they spend often more than half their time kind of below that level. And so right now the Federal Reserve's kind of in this trade-off of trying to get, you know, they, as, of, as of now, they've kind of gotten back to, you know, positive real rates on a, on a trailing basis. Um, but it's come at the cost of financial instability. And so you're, you're kind of going back and forth between where do you want to hold your money and then the money itself, is it going to hold value over, say, a, a, a 10 or 20 year period? Um, you know, it could certainly be very useful for periods of time, but it's like, is this something you want to store your, your energy in? Or do you want to go elsewhere? Do you want to go to equities? Do you want to go to commodities? Do you want to go to an asset like Bitcoin? And so I think that that's, that's one of the questions that people are, are looking at. And then when we, when we tie it into the potential de-dollarization, um, the, the, the somewhat diversification of, of reserve practices and payment systems around the world, you know, one way to look at this is that money is essentially a ledger. And, and so for the past 50 uh, plus years, the world's been really reliant on the Federal Reserve as kind of the ledger for the whole world. There's all these other central banks, um, but they, they, they themselves tie into the Federal Reserve and they, they tie into the U.S. Treasury system by, by holding assets, you know, connecting themselves to that ledger. And as we see kind of islands form, or as we see kind of a multipolar world in terms of all these different ledgers kind of competing with each other, an open distributed global ledger like Bitcoin, I think, becomes um, pretty interesting. On April 1, 2023, Lynn Alden caused a stir on Twitter by suggesting that Ether could be classified as a security based on the Howey test. Alden drew clear lines between commodities and securities, emphasizing the differences between the two, the concentration of power in the former, and the potential legal ramifications of the latter. Alvin started the conversation on Twitter by saying that unlike commodities, securities rely on a team of paid developers for its unstacking whereas commodities do not. The importance of asset classification to statists, but less to libertarians, was emphasized by Erica Wall. Alden elaborated on her position, explaining that she is not advocating for or against securities rules, but rather is concerned with the degree of centralization in order to foresee potential legal consequences. When Wall asked if Bitcoin could be considered a security, Alden said that it didn't meet any of the criteria since it is a system that wasn't created by an ICO and its changes are implemented by a soft fork that is initiated by the creators themselves. When Real Vision CEO Raul Powell entered the argument, things got interesting. Powell joked that Alden's position on Ether's designation as security was an April Fool's prank, but Alden made it plain that her opinion was taken seriously. According to the Howey test, in my opinion, ETH is still most likely a security. It does not, however, imply opposition to any specific course of action. The discussion has been complicated by the apparent jurisdictional struggle between the Commodity Futures Trading Commission CFTC and the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC over Ether, which has cast out on the cryptocurrency's ultimate categorization. Due to the current meme coin frenzy, the recently adopted Bitcoin token standard BRC20 has become the center of attention in the cryptocurrency industry, despite the continuing excitement. The token standard is still limited by factors related to the greater crypto ecosystem. BitPhoenix, a leading cryptocurrency exchange, released a research recently that highlighted the potential of token standards and the importance of developing new use cases to accelerate its wider acceptance. 
And that concludes our enlightening discussion with the esteemed financial analyst, Lynn Alden, where she revealed where the big bucks are running. We hope this video has provided you with valuable guidance in identifying lucrative investment avenues. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest content. At Market Empire, we're dedicated to empowering you on your journey to financial success. Thank you for joining us today.